Okay, so Nozick's good argument and his not-so-good argument for his position, I think both involve this Wilt Chamberlain case. He has other arguments, he has a lot of other arguments, but I think we can get into his case if we look at the Wilt Chamberlain case that he presents. Um, Dworkin talks about this, Wilt Chamberlain, Nozick wrote this book in the 70s, um, Wilt Chamberlain was the guy as far as basketball players go. You know, if you want to update this, plug in LeBron James or whoever, Steph Curry at the time, it was Wilt Chamberlain. So also, you know, you guys will notice he talks about a million dollars like it's a whole lot of money. And it is a lot of money. When Nozick wrote this in the early 70s, it was even more a whole lot of money. Make it 10 million if you want to. It sounds a little better to you, right? Okay, so what's the Wilt Chamberlain story, the Wilt Chamberlain case, and how is it supposed to prove, you know, Nozick's position? Well, Nozick says, look, suppose you are concerned with equality or with a fair distribution of money and resources. You step in and I'll let you redistribute money however you want. You can do it Rawls, you know. You Rawls can give people only the amount of money that helps the least well off. The least well off can be as well off as possible. Or any other distribution of income you might like, whatever you think is fair, we'll let you do it. But guess what? You do your fair distribution of income. Nobody has any more or any less money than they're supposed to. Well, what's going to happen? People will spend that money. And so this is what the Wilt Chamberlain case is supposed to illustrate. Everybody, imagine we do, we redistribute whatever way we think is quote unquote fair, be it Rawls's way or invent your own theory of justice. Everybody has as much money as they're supposed to have, no more, no less. Well, but then there's this Wilt Chamberlain guy. And Wilt Chamberlain, people really want to see him play basketball. And so Wilt Chamberlain cuts a deal with whatever team he's playing for at the time. And he says, look, you guys will get a lot more people coming to watch your games with me. So I'll make you a deal. I get a dollar from every ticket sold. Every single ticket, I get a dollar. And let's say we even make that explicit, right? I mean, this would be weird with actual tickets, but let's just say we make it explicit when you go online to buy your ticket to see the game, there's a little box that says dollar goes to Wilt, you have to check it to get your ticket. Or if you actually buy it at the box office, the person says, you do, you do know a dollar goes to Wilt Chamberlain, right? One dollar of every ticket, you say yes, you have to agree to that to get your ticket. Well, imagine this. A million people over the course of the season or whatever, pay money, they buy tickets, Wilt gets a dollar from every single one of them. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is things are no longer fair, or so says Nozick. Nozick's like, well, look, Wilt now has 10 million more dollars than he ought to, than your theory of justice, than your theory of fairness says he should, and everybody else that played to, paid to see him play, they have a dollar less. Well, that's unfair, so to maintain your fair distribution, you're going to have to step in constantly and redistribute money. You might Either you're going to have to constantly step in and take Wilt's money away from him every time he gets a dollar more than he has to, you take that dollar, or you tell people that they can't spend their money on what they want to. And those things should have to go with the latter, you know, right? People are going to spend their money on what they want to, so people are going to end up with more money than they quote-unquote ought to have. So any attempt, Nozick will say, to maintain a fair distribution, whatever you think a quote fair distribution of resources of income is, if you want to maintain it, you are going to have to constantly meddle in people's lives. So let's go through this argument. Any attempt to maintain a fair distribution of resources will involve massive and constant interference by the state in people's lives. 
So if the state tries to maintain a fair distribution of resources, it will violate people's basic freedoms. Freedom is more important than equality, so the state should not have any policy that violates people's basic freedoms. Therefore, the state should do nothing but protect our property and persons. Think about this argument for a second. Is this a good argument? Well, you guys probably know when I ask that question, it ain't. It's not a, if I think it's a good argument, I'm probably not going to ask, is it a good argument? That is very much a rhetorical question. This is a terrible argument. This is an atrocious argument. Now, Nozick makes it, but I think he has better arguments. If this were Nozick's only argument, you guys would not be reading Robert Nozick because this argument is stupid. Let me tell you why this argument is stupid. There's two reasons. One, it's not clear to me that any attempt to maintain a fair distribution of resources is going to involve constant meddling. Now, if it did, that would be a problem for Rawls or anyone who wants to talk about fair distribution of resources. Remember, Rawls has his two principles of justice. First principle, basic liberties takes precedence over the second. Rawls would say basic freedom more important than equality. So if there really were a conflict between having a just distribution of resources and respecting people's basic freedoms, then I think Rawls would be in a bind. I think we would all agree with Nozick. The problem is it doesn't seem like there is. Dworkin points this out. You know, look, <clears throat> it's not a stupid version of Rawls if Rawls' ideas were implemented stupidly, then I think he would run into the problem Nozick points out. But Rawls could just say, look, I'm not saying to maintain it, you should take a dollar every time somebody has more than they ought to. We could have progressive taxation. Every dollar beyond X is taxed at some incredibly high amount. And every dollar beyond Y, which is even bigger than X, is taxed at an even higher amount. You know, not like we take, every, you know, a dollar from Wilt every time he earns a dollar, but let's say when Wilt gets over 100000 we just tax him at 50%. When he gets over 500000 maybe we tax him at 70 When he gets to a million, maybe we tax him at 90 You might not like that, but that doesn't seem like it involves the constant and total interference Nozick has in mind. And look, I'll go even further to tell you why this is a stupid argument. And it's a stupid argument because plenty of states do try to maintain a fair distribution. They don't constantly meddle in people's freedom. Sweden tries to do this, Norway, the, the Scandinavian, you know, all the Scandinavian countries. You might not want to live in Sweden or Norway, but Sweden or Norway are not communist states where the state is constantly meddling in your affairs. You know, Nozick, when he gives this argument, it's one of those clever arguments that seems to prove up is down, black is white. How should you respond to those arguments? Well, you should call BS on them, right? If an argument, no matter how clever, proves something we know to be false, problem is the argument. And plenty of states do try to maintain a fair distribution without the kind of meddling Nozick says they would have to resort to. I think however clever Nozick's argument is, and if you guys go read the book, it's really clever. Well, that doesn't matter because it's wrong. It's provably and obviously wrong. There's even, there's one more problem with this argument. Even if premises one through four worked, that wouldn't prove Nozick's position. There are, the state could provide for education without trying to maintain a just distribution of resources. The state could provide pensions for the elderly, social security, things like that, without trying to provide a fair distribution. The state could even provide a minimum income for the poor without trying to maintain a fair distribution. We could say, well, we'll let people have as much money as they want, but we'll provide for these other things. 
We'll let people have as much money as they want, but we'll make sure the poor don't starve. Even if Nozick's argument worked, it would at best show that Rawls is wrong. It wouldn't show that we shouldn't have anything but the night watchman state. So this is, at least as Dworkin presents it, Nozick's argument is not a very good one. Well, why do we talk about Nozick? Why do we take him seriously? Because I think you can give Nozick a better argument from the Wilt Chamberlain example. You can do it, but it's going to take some work. That's where we'll start next time. We'll start doing that work.